the, the story was so that me and my co-founder, we met uh, at the university here in Finland, and we both had the same experience with music education. He wanted to play guitar, I wanted to play piano, and neither of us was successful in learning uh, because the, the means for me, private lessons, didn't work out the way I wanted it. Um, so I quit after about a year or two, and it turns out that happens to most people, actually, who start to play an instrument, they use, lose the motivation early, um, and then they quit playing. And we thought, well, somebody should do something about it, and so the first thing that we built was a product for children to motivate them to practice on their instruments. It was a very cute game that had animals and so on. And we launched uh, at Slush in 2011. And we were on the big pitching stage. And we did win that competition, which was awesome. And so that's how it all got started. And now that's not at all kind of what it is, the children's game. So can you talk a little bit about the process of? Yeah, so what was interesting is that Everyone seemed to love the product. The media liked it, the parents liked it, um, but it didn't really make any money. It was an iPad app only, and at least back in the days, I think the idea that the parents would pay money for their um, kids, I don't know, services, was not that big. So we realized that we probably have to go after an, a different audience, and it actually went back to the original idea, which is me and Mikko back then. It was like, there is quite a lot of people who are actually not children who want to learn to play an instrument, or who had started at some point and, and given up, or who still have a dusty guitar uh, somewhere in a, in a garage. And so the next product we built was really much more for an older audience. It was still a very much a game. Uh, it had a character and so on. Um, and that was then the next product that we launched. And over time, what we realized is that we had half of our idea wrong and half was right. So the idea to use game-like features to motivate people to practice was a really good idea. The idea to make a game and tell people, hey, look, there is a game, and if you play it, you learn to play guitar, was actually not a good idea. People are genuinely looking to learn to play an instrument. And so we, at some point, with a lot of A-B testing and changing the layout and, and the, the messaging, we, we came to the conclusion, we should actually not have a game that teaches to play an instrument. We should have a, a, an instrument learning service and use the game-like features within that. And that's when we rebranded. We rebranded the company name. We uh, launched Musician um, as the brand and the product. And the company now have the same name. And you will not find really the game name or the, the word game anywhere in the description. So it really is an online service that teaches people how to play an instrument. Uh, so you use your real instrument, and it listens to what you, what you play. And we still have game-like features. I mean, there is still things in it um, that you can unlock an, a next level. Um, which is educationally very important so that we don't allow users to try to play too hard songs too early because that's really frustrating. So you have to unlock your way into the harder levels. And you can also, for example, compete with other players on high scores and see who is the best guitarist out there. And how did you like, figure out that you were onto something when you, when you changed? I'm assuming you didn't just rebrand the company on a whim um, with no testing. Yeah, well, we, obviously, we did some testing with yeah. the previous product. Yeah. And we realized the more we go in this direction, the better it is. But then, of course, it was a bit of a leap of faith. And what was interesting is we didn't tell anyone about this. Like, typically, we would think the first thing a company does, or what, what we would try to do, and we had a bit of traction, and there was a bit of awareness in the market already of us, that we would say, hey, we are doing a new product. But we didn't. And the reason for that is we wanted to understand how our marketing actually works um, with the untracked marketing. So when we, for example, run YouTube ads, some of them people click on the ad and they download the app. Um, but you never know exactly how many of them, because many people see the YouTube ad, then they open a new tab, and they search for the word, and they find you like this. So you cannot attribute the ad click. So we never know how many people actually find musicians through our ads. And this was a once in a company history opportunity where nobody knew the brand. We haven't told anyone, no media, <laughs> no nobody, not even our existing users. We just started running ads. And so we knew everyone who comes to Musician must have heard about it through our ads. So we could finally have a really nice baseline, actually, where to get started. And funny enough, the, the users we then had on our previous product, which was still live at the time, we're all complaining to our new product by saying, you guys are just copying what this other product is doing, which, uh, except <laughs> that you don't have the game, uh, game look and so on, uh, which is, of course, to some extent, also correct. Um, but yeah, it turned out to work really well. I think people, as I said, uh, they react really positively to it. I mean, we would never go back. So that's the way to go. And you know, speaking of marketing, um, you are obviously in Finland, where there are not 
a ton of consumer-facing startups. Um, you've hired about 100 people right now, including like a lot of people who are in charge of marketing and promoting, um, you know, spreading the word to obviously consumers. Uh, so, what are the challenges, I guess, of being of a place uh, where there there isn't a lot of other companies doing that? Yeah, I think yeah. so. In that sense, I mean, and as it was said in the introduction, different countries have different challenges. And I think in Finland, we have an amazing engineering talent. Um, there is a lot of experience in B2B uh, and hardware products as well. When it comes to consumer software, like direct to consumer software services, like Musician One is, there is very little actually. And uh, that also means there is quite little talent. Uh, I compare it a bit like if you want to. Uh, the exception, obviously, are games. So the games community here is amazing, and there is a lot of good talent. It's a, a really a great cluster. But for other things, there is actually not that much. And I compare it a bit like if you want to start an ice hockey team in Finland, it's pretty good. You have like a lot of people who already play ice hockey, and, and there is the network, and everything is I I available. If you want to start a consumer brand like Musician, it's actually much harder. It's like starting a baseball team. So you have to find people who are, let's say, sporty enough uh, maybe from another sport, and you try to train them in the direction mm -hmm. of playing baseball. And so that's a bit what we find. So in the beginning, we really couldn't find pretty much anyone here who has had experience uh, building a consumer brand, a consumer software brand, and marketing that consumer product um, from Finland. And in the beginning, we essentially went after. We just hired very young, very hungry, very talented people who didn't have any experience in this, but we. We trained them or we learned together uh, because neither did I have any experience in this nor my co-founder Mikko. So that was the starting point and I think we got really far. But at some point when the, when the levels of our marketing reached where they are now, so we spend several million uh, dollars a month on marketing spend. I mean, at some point, it, the, scaling a team with young and hungry is going to be really dangerous to put so much money into the hands of a person who hasn't had that experience. And again, nor did we. And that's at least one of the things we now did um, I mean, in the beginning, you start importing people, so we try to actually find people to move over to Finland who have that experience, and that worked for some roles, and it was harder from other, for other roles. But now we actually, in the beginning of this year, we opened an office in New York specifically for that reason. So in New York, there is a lot of talent who have actually done and have run marketing campaigns and marketing um, at this level and this scale, and so we have a team of about 10 people now in New York. Yeah, it's so that. interesting to hear you talk about your challenges finding marketing people because um, being based in New York a lot of, a long time, um, I often hear a lot about how hard it is to find engineers and how there's just marketing people everywhere. Um, <laughs> so perhaps an exchange program. Yeah, we could do an exchange program. I think it's, yeah. to be fair, I think it's also difficult yeah. to find engineers here. It's definitely not as difficult as it mm -hmm. is probably in, in Silicon Valley or in New York. But I think the speakers just before spoke exactly about this, um, the, the, the lack of, of people who actually do software engineering. Now, we are in that sense extremely fortunate uh, as a company for one strange reason, and that reason is that in my generation, um, I'm, so I'm not from Finland, I'm from Switzerland originally, um, but in my generation, and that actually does include me, there is a lot of Finnish people who really love heavy metal and wanted to become heavy metal guitarists. Um, and so at some point probably turned out, well, that's not the most safe or feasible career choice, so let's do something else. And many of them then got into coding. So as it turns out, there is a lot of people in this country who are really good at coding and really good at guitar. And for them, we are a very nice and very attractive uh, workplace because many of our teammates or of our, our engineers, they actually do work in such a way that they have to test the program. So almost all of us have an instrument standing next to their desk, a guitar, and you can see people play a lot. And that makes it actually really nice. Um, for us to recruit people or to hire people, because a lot of uh, Finnish engineers are really into tech, obviously, and really into playing an instrument, and that makes Musician an interesting place to work at. So we have a, an advantage there, um, but it's still hard. And did you ever consider, so a lot of times the um, people of trouble in, the, in New York hiring engineering talent end up opening uh, or hiring remote workers from all over the country or anything like that. Did you ever consider that as a, a strategy? Yeah, the, the remote team is an interesting one. And we have actually had a couple of experiences with this, but it didn't work so well for us. And one of the reasons for us is it's, uh, or what we found is that what we are doing, this digital music education field, there is still, I mean, it's still a long way to go. I think we have invented something that's, um, that's going to be somewhat of a standard, but there is still a long way to go. 
so the product is not, it's not clear what we should do. And we still experiment a lot with, the, with the, what the product actually should be, what the service should be, how to do certain things, the interaction with an instrument and the device. And for all these reasons, we found it's very meaningful that the team is actually together. So it helps us when the audio engineers are together with the music educators, with the product managers, with the designers. And when you separate people from each other, these, let's say, random encounters and these crazy ideas do not happen. Um, and that's why for us the remote working hasn't worked so well. And then there is another point where I, um, I just want to make this because I actually really like working. I like our company and a lot of us do as well. So yes, it can be convenient occasionally to work from home, that you get a delivery or something else. But we actually want the team to come together because it's actually nice to come to a really nice office. We have a stage there. We have really cool people. We, go for lunch together or bring in lunch. So it, it also creates this kind of social layer um, where, I mean, music is one of the wonderful forces that bring people together. And that's why I understand why companies make the rationale of doing remote uh, teams because they can't fire the, the talent. But for us, that felt always a bit strange because our goal as a company is actually to bring people together. Um, and when we opened the New York office, the first thing we wanted to do is actually make sure that we have quite a few employees so they can start building this thing there as well, uh, a, a sort of community. I mean, we are not a family, we are still a company, but it's actually nice to hang out. And as I said before, it's not just with the engineers, like almost everyone in our team, excluding the founders, weirdly enough, play very well instruments or not, I mean, many, like really good and are really into music. And that creates something that at least after work, a lot of people actually do things together. Uh, in the Helsinki office, we actually play quite a lot. The New York team, they more go to concerts, so they have DJs there. Um, and that is something that is actually nice to bring people together. We do have one person working remotely in Australia. So technically, we have three offices, one in Europe, one in the US, and one in Australia. But that was a weird story, because James was one of our most active users, and he was super engaged. And um, at some point, we asked him to do a song for us. Then he came over. We really loved the guy. And today, he's in charge of the music education program for the guitar. And he's doing a phenomenal job. And we see him every once in a while. Um, but that's the exception. I, we, we are not hiring remote uh, people other than in our offices anymore. And is that more of a solitary project, like shaping the program for guitar? Or is there a reason that that particular position works well? I think it works well for two reasons. One is it is fairly clear what has to be done. The feedback mechanisms, I mean, we, 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 obviously, we get all the data based on the learning uh, experience of the user. So, you can look at the data and see where are the problems in our syllabus. Are some songs too hard? Are some videos not good to explain what you're supposed to do next? So you actually have the data, and it's quite clear where the holes are. I think that's one of the reasons. And then making the music, making the exercises, coming up with the syllabus ideas and so on, it's still a lot of individual work, actually. So that's the one reason. The other reason is James is he's a very social guy as well. So he connects very well with the other educators here. Um, and that's why they can make it work. And yeah, it's, at some point, the team actually wanted to build up some kind of a robot, the James bot, so we could actually have him <laughs> at our office. Yeah. Uh, we try to fly him over every once in a while. It's hard to bring somebody from the, from the beaches of Australia to Finland, at least during this part of the season. But he's joining us for the Y Edu um, conference that we organize every year, about which we are, I think, going to talk about as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, and kind of this idea of working together, you actually take one step further than most companies. Um, you just got back from the Caribbean, where you spent the month working with your entire team of 100 people, uh, who you brought all of them um, with you and worked together. Yeah, it's at the moment easy to spot the musician team members uh, in the audience, <laughs> because we are the ones with the 10. So yes, that's what we do. And I think it actually relates also a bit to, the, to, the, um, to our philosophy. I mean, we are an education company, and we also believe very strongly in, in investing in our team and team education. Now, one way that we have found that works really well is actually connecting our team with experts from different companies. They may not be competitors, but they are doing similar things. And so, yes, we take our whole team for one month abroad. Uh, we have done this now the fifth time. So the first time when we did it, we were about 10 people. And we rented the villa in Greece. And we flew everyone there. And for one month, we, we just worked from Greece. All we need for our work is a laptop, internet connection, and instruments. And they are all things that you can bring. 
So we spent a month there, and then it worked so well. The team really liked it. It was great for the team spirit and getting people together. And so we did it every year. So after Greece, we went to Thailand, to Tenerife. Last year, we were in Bali. And just like on Sunday, I returned from, from Curaçao in the, in the Caribbean, where we were now 100 people. And it's, it's, I mean, it's becoming different challenges and so on. But it's actually quite amazing to take the team there and to, I mean, obviously we do work there but the fir uh, for three weeks, but the first week is a very different week. That one we fully dedicate to professional development of the team. So what we have done is we have invited guest speakers uh, who join us for a week. So last year we had, I mean, one of the speakers here at Slush, uh, this year, uh, Casey Winters, he was the head of growth at Pinterest and Grubhub was there, somebody from Uber was there. We invited a, a, an active user from our user community to join us. This year, we had a head of growth from Duolingo, the language learning service. We had a UX, uh, lead UX designer from um, Netflix and Google. And then again, one very active user. And so the idea is on the first day of that week, my whole team essentially sits in a conference room. And these people present from their perspective like what they've done uh, at Duolingo or, or at, at Netflix. Um, or then what is their experience with musician so that our team understands who they are, what's their background, what they know, what they're interested, what they're talking about. So that's day one. And the other four days of the first week, we organize workshops where the team can work on different concepts and they can invite these speakers. So for example, our growth team was obviously really excited to actually sit down with Gina uh, from Duolingo and talk like, okay, what are the commonalities between language learning and music learning? What could we learn from you? Uh, of course, the other way as well. And it's actually really nice that for once you don't have you know, a one hour meeting slot allocated, but you can actually say, let's sit down in the morning and go through our marketing mm -hmm. and what we do and what you do at Duolingo, let's go for lunch. And so that's week number one that is fully dedicated to professional development. Uh, the developers, they are also hacking and they have some hack day projects and things like this. Um, and then the remaining three weeks are we do just normal work. We just do them from a, from a beautiful setting, but they are normal work, as in the teams get back together and they continue on their roadmap. And so taking uh, 100 people to the Caribbean for a month is obviously pretty expensive. It's, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so when like, your investors say, hey, Chris, like, why, is this, why is this worth it? What are we getting from it? What do you say? Um, well, I have two answers to them. One is I actually do not have to justify this to our investors because we made it from the beginning very clear that we have a clear hierarchy of priorities. Number one is the user and our company mission. Mm -hmm. Number two is our company culture and our team. And only number three is the shareholders value, which is if we find something that we, that we want to do and we believe is beneficial for the team and the users, we do it anyway. So our investors have never questioned this. But yes, it is true. It is quite expensive uh, to do this thing. Um, and it, is, it would be difficult to really put a dollar sign on, okay, so what? So we invest mm -hmm. somewhere between one and a half and 2,000 euros it costs per employee uh, to do this, including flights and the accommodation. And it would be quite hard to actually measure the bottom line. But how you can see it is just in the team spirit as we get back, how much, you know, the connections. And as, a, as the company grows to 100 people, what typically happens, and I'm pretty sure that happens in most companies, at some point you still cluster. The backend engineers spend time with the backend engineers and the marketers with the marketers. In our case, the New York team, obviously, with the New York team and so on. And what is very beautiful, uh, obviously, when you're in the Caribbean, I mean, the work days are the work days, but then there is still the evenings and the weekends, and some people are really active. They go hiking and kiting and diving and all these uh, active activities, and they are not correlated to the profession. So now suddenly you have completely different groups of people spending time together, getting to know each other. And what is really nice and what I can see now being back uh, this week is that the groups have in a way changed. So people go with different people for lunch and hang out with different people. And that is something I think as the company grows and the communication between different departments, it becomes very expensive when the one side of the company doesn't know what the other one is, is, uh, um, is doing or not doing. So I believe there is a lot of value in this one. Um, and then there is still the part where also you have to, you have to live what you preach. So we, our company's mission is to make musicality as common as literacy. And we believe we can bring a lot of value and joy to people who learn to play an instrument. It's a wonderful thing. And when you sometimes see these cheesy images of you know, a group of friends hanging out at the beach and playing an instrument, that's what we do. And that's what we do almost every evening in this month. And we had the most epic jam session that I wasn't there for the whole time. It started at 5 in the evening. 
Uh, it was on Friday, the last of the first week. It started at five, and apparently people were still jamming at four in the morning. <laughs> so that was just amazing. So this thing actually happened, and I think every once in a while it's actually really nice to recognize of the value that we try to provide to our users. We can experience it ourselves. So there is also this part, to be fair. I think for myself personally, and I know for many of my teammates, this trip uh, that we take every year is among the highlights of the professional year. Uh, you get to know your colleagues better. You get um, out of the weather from Finland. Um, you get to spend some good time at the beach, and you get to jam a lot. And do you think that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I like that you, you you said that everybody's musically talented except for the co-founders. So you, got, I mean, which is good because you have to test the product. Yes. Otherwise, they wouldn't know because you're supposed to be learning when you use it. I. <laughs> and and I think the, the irony is this applies to almost everything. So I have a funny story about this. When we started the company um, in the first year. We, we, we tried to raise money because neither of us also couldn't code. Um, so we couldn't do that. We couldn't do music. We couldn't do that. We couldn't teach. We didn't have any really relevant experience. And so we were trying to find investors, and we really couldn't. But there was one, one meeting with an investor I still remember very well. And it was so we just started. And he says, like, oh, so you do music education. So you guys are music teachers. And we're like, uh, no. And he's like, oh, so you're musicians. And we're like, actually, no. <laughs> It's like, so you're audio engineers, and we are, no, and you know, it's like in a job interview when all the questions they ask, and you're like, actually, no, and it just went on. So you have done a business before? No, 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 and then in the end, we were really like, we felt quite bad. Like none of the answers we gave to that investor was satisfactory, or we felt it was, and. Then his answer was like, that's brilliant. This is where innovation comes from, when completely new and fresh minds think about an old problem. So this is really great. And it was actually quite nice to hear that. And we asked him, like, so are you going to invest? And he said, oh, no, 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 that's, that's a different topic. But I love that you guys are doing it. And so the whole company is actually built around the idea that since we know that we do not know, our job is not to try to invent the future. Our job is to find the very best people that we can in each area, games, education, software engineering, uh, music, and let them do their job, get out of their way. And for me, actually, it's quite nice to still remain the naive person who is coming and sees this product and says, listen, guys, I know you have studied music for many, many years. I haven't. I don't understand what you're talking about here. If I don't understand it, our users won't most likely won't either. Uh, so let's make this simpler. And I think it's actually a nice position to be in. Seems very nice. So unfortunately, <laughs> we're out of time. Um, but thank you so yeah. much for, for talking. Thank you very much for the interview. <laughs> and thanks for having me. And have a nice day.